So um, I'm glad that almost everyone made it today. A lot are online today, but that's fine. Uh, because today we are doing films, and even though I am recording this lecture, chunks of it end up getting taken out because of copyright. Uh, so those of you that are attending are actually going to get the full lesson. Those that are hoping to just watch it on a rerun on YouTube are going to be missing bits and pieces here and there because uh, of those copyright laws that I get to go in and edit. This is like the one lecture that I have to try and edit. <laughs> and I don't like editing things. I'm too lazy to do that. Um, that being said, we are going to be flipping back and forth quite a bit today. And hopefully more than just Courtney can pipe up and let me know if something's not working right. Because there will probably be points in time today when either things won't get shared correctly or you guys won't see videos or you guys won't hear sounds. So if that happens, let me know. Uh, a good chunk of the films we're going to be watching are silent films. Um, I'll let you know when it's going to be a silent film versus when it's going to be a film with sound, uh, meaning words. <laughs> if you can't hear the words, you should probably let me know at some point. Um, that being said, today is the fun medium lecture, at least to me, it's the one I enjoy the most teaching uh, just because I am a big movie goer and I think it's kind of fun that we have a lesson that we get to watch a bunch of movies because um, that doesn't really happen too much in college or in any class really. So for today, like yesterday, we are going to be going over the history of something Yesterday was the history of photography. Today is going to be the history of films. Uh, we're also going to be looking at different examples of vocabulary words. So we're going to start off with some vocabulary. That red word was underlined and I was wondering why it was misspelled, but it's not misspelled. <laughs> So cinematography is basically what we're going to be looking at today. It's the photography of camera work and filmmaking using photography to make films. Um, so the very first film we're going to look at today is a great example of cinematography. Uh, if you're thinking of like a flip book with images on each page and if you flip through it really fast, it looks like things are moving. That's basically how this first film is going to be. It's going to be a series of photographs put together to make it look like things are moving if you run through it fast enough. Persistence of vision is our second vocabulary word. Persistence of vision is when we remember what we've seen after we've seen it. So for example, if you watch a movie and then two days later, you start thinking about the movie, you probably start seeing the characters in your mind's eye. Um, or for example, last night I watched a movie and then later on that night, I was thinking about different scenes of the movie and I was seeing the scenes in my mind's eye. So persistence of vision is the idea that even after we've seen something, we still remember what it looks like. And that's basically how a film works. It uses that idea that we remember stories and images to try and connect scene from scene to create the whole film. A shot is a continuous running um, segment of the film, meaning they didn't stop it. Film editing is selecting those best shots and reassembling them together to make the film. Montage is our kind of most complex word. 
a montage is combining different shots together to try and create some sort of emotion in the viewer. So a great example of that is a film called Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock. There's the shower scene where it goes from her showering to a guy sneaking up with a knife and then she's showering and then you see the knife again and then she's showering and then you see the knife and then all of a sudden the music kicks in and you start seeing blood and like stabbing motions. Uh, the idea of the knife and the stabbing and the blood incites in the viewer an emotion of fear or thrill. Um, so a montage is combining those different images together to try and get an emotion and for a psycho it's fear. Film noir is a genre of film that was developed in Hollywood. Uh, so genres are like romance, thriller, action, horror. Uh, film noir is another genre. It's generally a black and white film, even though they had color at that point in history. They did these in black and white. And the themes are usually very dramatic and based around like crime stories. And once again, we're going to be looking at different examples of all of these. And then a storyboard is arranging drawings on a board. So for films, you wouldn't want to shoot your entire film and then decide if scenes are going to work together or not. You would draw out the scenes on paper, really fast sketches, and then line them on, up, up, uh, up on a board and move them around to see which scenes would fit better in which areas. And then you can talk to the ones that you don't need to film because you wouldn't want to pay actors or animators to make those scenes if they aren't even going to work. So a brief history of film. Um, the official motion camera picture machine was invented in 1890. Once again, we're going to be looking at an earlier example than 1890. That is basically a flip book of photographs, and that is our very first official film, but it does not use a motion picture camera. It just uses a regular camera. Um, but the first motion picture camera was from 1890. Original films were made without sound. They would have a backtrack of music with them, but there would be no like people talking or conversing. Uh, and that lasted until 1927, at least in America. Europe was a little bit ahead of time with films in comparison. The first film studio was built in 1897. Panning shots were first used by the director D.W. Griffith in 1898. He was also the first director to use a close-up in a film. So a panning shot, for those of you that don't know, it's when you start at one side and work your way all the way over to the other. Our iPhones do that now. <laughs> it's like the landscape panning shot. Um, and then a close-up is when you don't get the full body of a person. You usually just do like their face or their shoulders and up. And the first director to do both those things was D.W. Griffith. So you can bet money we're going to be looking at his films. The Jazz Singer was the very first talkie or movie with people talking in them uh, in America, and that was 1927. France was doing words in their movies prior, and other movies had tried it in America, but they were not successful. The Jazz Singer was the first successful movie to use words. Therefore, it's gotten the title of being the first talkie. In 
1937, the first animated film was released by Walt Disney, and that's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. A couple years after that, The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind came out, and those are our first Technicolor films. And they both competed against each other that year in the awards shows. In 1970, the production code was removed and replaced with a rating system. So the rating system is the PG, G, PG, 13 R system that we go by today to determine what like age level is appropriate for someone to see that movie. Prior to the rating system, they used that production code. How the production code worked is they would just fine you if your movie contained too many like bad words or like nude scenes, they would just fine that studio. Uh, the first film to get fined by the production code system was Gone with the Wind for their very famous final line from Rhett Butler. They were fined several thousand dollars. Which back in 1939, that was quite a bit. Um, and then of course, in the 1980s, there was a VCR that allowed home viewing of movies finally. And then today we have like a ton of new stuff and where we can just stream stuff on Netflix constantly. So movies are everywhere and pretty easy to come by now. So that takes us to our very first film. Our first film is 1878. Once again, if you remember, the motion picture camera wasn't invented until 1890. So this film does not use a motion picture camera. It uses a regular camera. Uh, so what it is, is this a series of camera shots that this guy has combined together and put into like a film reel system and run it through really fast through a light box. So it looks like the, it's a film. It looks like it's moving. Um, the first movie was invented because a guy named Edward Moybridge, and yes, that's how you spell his name, it's like weird. Um, but he was wanting to win a bet. He bet his buddy that when a horse or a racehorse was running at full speed, at some point, um, there would always be one foot on the ground. His friend said that if a racehorse was running at full speed, there's a point in time when there are no hooves on the ground. Because if you've ever seen a horse run, it does really look like there's a point when there's not any hooves touching the ground. It looks kind of like they're all fast and off the ground. Uh, so what he did is he set up some trip wires around a racetrack, uh, and the cameras would be triggered when the horse got close enough. Of course, the wires were in front of the camera, because if you remember, cameras back then were kind of slow. So the wires would be triggered, and then when the horse got to the camera section, it would take a picture. And then you combine all of those shots together to make a short, very, very short 30-second film to see if he would win the money or not. So do you guys think that there's always one foot on the ground, or do you think that all of the feet are off the ground at some point? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone think they all come off the ground? Yeah. Well, you'd be right. There's always one foot on the ground. So let's see that short film. I always think it's kind of interesting to consider the fact that the first film was made just because a guy wanted to win a bet. And it also seems a bit fitting too. And this has no sound, of course. 
And here's our first film. You can even see the areas where the shots have been pasted together. Those little lines. Wait, did I say there's always one on the ground? Oops. <laughs> we all would have lost. <laughs> That was the first film. Like I said, it's super short. And it's just a bunch of photographs pasted together. That takes us to our next film. The next film is by a French director named George Millet. And it's the trip to the moon or a voyage to the moon from 1902. This film is extremely important because prior to it, uh, the way that directors and producers set up their films was like a stage, like a theater stage play. So there would be entrances and exits between the scenes and you would literally see people walking on and off the stage. Um, what George Millet did is he would use fade-ins and fade-outs to switch the scenes instead of watching people walk on and off stage. And how he did that is he would layer different film shots on top of each other and kind of clear, make them a little bit translucent. This is also a silent film, but it does have a uh, back track music uh, it, it's only about 13 minutes long and we are going to watch the whole thing because it is only 13 minutes. Um, so this was made once again in 1902 and it's about a trip to the moon. Had we been to the moon yet in 1902? They're all shaking their head no. They are correct. We had not been to the moon yet. So what do you think this film is going to be about if it's about a trip to the moon? What are some of the things we might see? Exactly. They, they didn't know what was on the moon, right? They didn't know how they were going to get to the moon in 1902. They didn't know what was on it. So this was, of course, a fantasy uh, interpretation of what a trip to the moon would have been in George Millet's mind in 1902. Um, of course, today we know better. So this is a bit, it's not supposed to be a comedy, but it is funny. So feel free to laugh at certain points if you want to, because it's cute. It's cute to see what they thought would happen. Going to be wizards that get us to the moon, according to George Murray. Thank <laughs> you. 
switched scenes and instead of watching people exit and enter from the stage we just faded in <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
was the whole film. What'd you guys think of it? It is a cute one. I think that one's a pretty cute one. Yeah, yeah. So that's like a spin on the idea that like movies have stars, you know? And then um, the guy, and then just like a man in the moon with the like little bullet on his eye that's like a common trope that people keep reusing i know that two weeks ago or whenever that movie came out my nephew wanted to sit and watch that netflix movie the the moon one i don't remember what it's called but it's a new one it's a little cartoon and i noticed in the background on one scene there was the picture of the moon with the thing in his eye um that's just another side note that it's important to keep in mind that people that are going into film, they will go to film school and they'll come across George Millay's trip to the moon or voyage to the moon as well. And sometimes certain images stick with us, which goes back to that persistence of vision. Now, once again, we watched that one so that we could see George Millay's adaption of using fade-ins and fade-outs in between scenes, although it had a lot of other cute stuff like snow on the moon and them just using a giant cannon to get there and just using gravity to fall back down. Uh, if only it were that easy. And the moon men. Um, now we're going to move on to D.W. Griffith's Intolerance, which has a completely different tone. It's not cute like uh, the last one was. This one's from 1916. 
and it has to do with the city of Babylon in ancient Babylon and kind of showing off the wealth and glory and power of that ancient people. Uh, so this film uses a wide panning crane shot and it's the first film to use a wide panning crane shot. That's because they spent a ton of money on their film set and they wanted to get good shots of it to show it off. Plus, the main premise of the film is that Babylon is wealthy. Of course, you'd want to show off the whole city to show off how wealthy it was. Uh, he also used close-ups. The shot that I, well, actually, you can't find a close-up shot on YouTube anymore. You used to be able to. Uh, but just a reminder that close-ups only show part of the person's body very close, not the full length of the human body. Usually it's just a head shot, um, but he is also the first director to make use of close-ups in film. And this is another silent movie, but it does have sound for the music score. And this is the opening scene, by the way, uh, so it starts off with that large crane shot. strange film. <laughs> um, if you notice it mentioned Ishtar in there. Ishtar is an Egyptian goddess and they're all standing around walking like this because of the wall murals that they found in ancient Babylon and Egypt. They thought that's like what people actually looked like all the time. Um, so it's an interesting take uh, once again from an early time period. But the budget for that film for 1916 was huge. And I'm guessing you can probably tell they spent the budget on making that set. 
So the columns, the elephants, all of that is stuff that they made for that film. So they wanted to show off that very well. And the crane was rented for them to be able to do that, which was also an expensive thing to do. Um, so D.W. Griffith and his intolerance showing off crazy sets for 1916. I mean, even today, we don't really see sets with like that. We just CGI stuff now. Um, so it's pretty impressive for that time. Moving on to our next little um, vocabulary word. This one is our example of montage. Uh, once again, another silent film. This is Sergei Eisenstein's The Battleship Potomkin from 1925. He is the first director that made use of using multiple very short, quick shots and images of things to try and incite from the viewers. So the emotion that he was attempting to convey with the Odessa steps scene that we're going to watch uh, is trying to elicit the emotion of horror. However, it comes across today is a little bit interesting and slightly funny, um, but that's not what it was supposed to be. It's just now we have a lot better acting um, and we don't have men dressing up as women in our films because we need them to carry something heavy. Um, of interest. We aren't going to watch the whole film because it's about two hours long and it's not that interesting to watch, but I mean if you're really into it you can watch the whole thing. It is a Russian film, so that takes us to a different continent. We went to France with George Millet. D.W. Griffith is an American director and now we're going to Russia. And this is a historical film. Well, not really historical, but it's based on a piece of Russian history. And like I said, I'm just showing you the Odessa steps scene. Let me see if I can get it to the beginning or not. going back and forth from the guys holding to the, the guns to the guys running to the people hiding to the people falling dead on the steps. Having those short brief shots all put together is what montage is. It's having brief shots put together in a way that tries to elicit some sort of emotion from us. This one's supposed to make us feel scared for the people that are suffering from the atrocity. Thank you. 
So once again, that was our example of montage that, like I said, is a historical scene uh, that illustrates the invasion of the Cossacks into Odessa, Russia, and civilians were killed. Uh, so that was supposed to illustrate that, which is why it's supposed to elicit horror and fear and disgust in what happened. Of course, today, because we have such advanced technologies with movies, it doesn't really come across as that anymore. Um, but when it was first released, it did just that, and it became a very popular film. And that takes us to the 1920s in the invention of the talkie or movies with actual people talking um, that you can hear. Uh, like I said earlier, talkies did exist prior to 1927, but the jazz singer is considered to be the first successful use of people talking in a film. The others were not successful. Therefore, it has garnered the title of being the first movie produced with sound. The main reason why most people consider it to probably have being successful is the fact that it has a lot of really catchy music to it, like jazz music um, and songs like Bluebird. Uh, if you ever look up that song, you can. Um, I don't like to show scenes from the jazz singer because I don't consider it to be appropriate uh, because they do use blackface and I just don't like to show, I don't consider that appropriate. In 1927, they didn't really think about things like that, um, but now we know better. But the songs are catchy and they are still used today in different ways. You can find clips of it on YouTube, but I just don't want to go there <laughs> for personal reasons. And that takes us to our first artistic film, which is by Salvador Dali. You need to go outside and get some water or something? I agree. I figured so. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what happened. I do that all the time. Uh, but um, Salvador Dali is a surrealist artist. I vaguely talked about that with Rene Magritte in his This Is Not a Pipe thing from the beginning of the semester. 
Um, but surrealist artists make artworks based on based on like dreams. Now here's my question for you. Do dreams make sense all the time? No. Do we recognize images in the dreams? Yes. But sometimes those images don't make any sense. So that's what Dali makes his art based on. He tries to study what his dreams mean and understand them better. This is around the same time that Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, the psychologists, became very popular and their books were being released. Uh, so the Surrealists picked up, picked up on those studies and started getting into them and started making art based around them. So the film that we're going to watch from Salvador Dali is called The Andalusian Dog from 1929. There was sound at this point, however, we did not have um, talking in this film. It is a silent film with music. Uh, it is black and white and it is surrealist, meaning that there's going to be images that we can recognize in the film, but they aren't going to make sense put together, just like a dream. And you can try and make sense of the images, but thus far, most people just theorize different things about it. There's no like set idea. This opening scene is really, really famous, but some people get grossed out by it. But it is super famous. So, I mean, if you're squeamish, I don't know. Was there a question? I was asking if you could share it on our screen. Oh, sorry. I told you guys. <laughs> Like, you're going to have to let me know if it doesn't share right. So if you really look at that, everyone, everyone that saw this thought it was really her eyeball that he sliced it open. But if you notice, there's, um, let me see if I can get to it. There's like hair around it. Uh, it's actually a dead cow's eye. Like you just got a cow head. Yeah, um, but everyone was freaking out. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why this film became really famous. Um, he ended up using that theme throughout a lot of his later artworks as well, just because he became well known for it.
So, does it make sense? No, it's because it's surrealism. Do you recognize the images? Yeah, you can figure out there's a hand. There's a box that keeps popping up over and over again. The guy was looking at his hand. So hand, box, um, the beach is going to be another theme that keeps popping up. But the way that the film is arranged and the lack of storyline and plotline makes it impossible to really understand what's going on. Um, yeah, exactly like a dream, because that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to represent a dream. Eventually, the cow is going to get repurposed later on in the film, too. Um, it's going to end up being tied to a piano and drug across the floor. It's weird. <laughs> um, so Salvador Dali was close friends with director and producer Alfred Hitchcock. I mentioned him earlier with the film Psycho. Um, He's very well known for producing thrillers such as The Birds, um, Vertigo, Rear Window. If you are into old timey thrillers, this movies are actually really good. Um, they do have talking. Uh, Spellbound is the one we're going to be looking at. Well, actually, we aren't going to look at it. I'll just describe it. Um, so in Spellbound, which it is a black and white film, not all of Hitchcock's films are black and white, though. It does have talking. Um, with Spellbound, there's a dream sequence. Uh, the main character ends up getting amnesia, and they try to hypnotize him to bring back his memories. That's like the main plot of the film. And when he's under hypnosis, they ask him to describe his what he's seeing in his dreams to try and make sense of it. Um, and because Hitchcock and Dolly were close friends and Hitchcock knew that Dolly was really into dreams, uh, Hitchcock actually asked Salvador Dolly to produce that uh, section of the film, which is about 10 minutes long. And you'll see uh, at the very beginning of the dream sequence, the man discusses a wall of eyes, because if you remember, an illusion dog has an eye at the very beginning. And on the wall of eyes, one of them gets cut in half, because that's what happened in Andalusian dog. So a lot of the same things that we see in Andalusian dog end up popping up again in that really well-known film, Spellbound, or at least it was really popular when it first came out. Probably not so much today. So that takes us to the invention of color films. The first two color films were The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. Um, there were, once again, just like with talkies, uh, films released in color prior to those two. However, they were not successful. Uh, therefore, those two are considered to be the first two films in color. Who here has not seen Gone with the Wind? Okay, we might look at that one. Who here has not seen Wizard of Oz? Has anyone online not seen The Wizard of Oz? Okay, so then you all know that scene where it switches from black and white and then Dorothy opens the door and all of a sudden there's Technicolor. So that scene became extremely popular and well known because it was the first experience of moviegoers of color film. So imagine going to the movies and only ever seeing black and white films. Wizard of Oz starts off black and white and then all of a sudden, bam, there's color. Uh, the first opening night, people didn't know that was going to happen, so it was a huge surprise. And then, of course, that garnered a lot of other attention in newspapers and magazines and reviews for other people to attend that film. Gone with the Wind was released that same year. The entire film is in color. It is based off of a book of the same title. It's a really, really long film. It's about six hours. Um, it actually was so long that it required two film reels. So there's an um, overture, uh, like you would go to a play and there'd be an overture for a brief moment for you to refill concessions or go to the bathroom. Uh, 
And they did that so that they could change the first film reel to the second one because they couldn't put the film on one reel back then. Uh, of course, now you can. And that film is about the antebellum South. And I did not pull it up and I should have because most people haven't seen it. Now's the time to find it. But um, Antebellum South, for those of you that are not sure what that word is, it's about uh, pre, during, and post Civil War. And we follow the main character, Scarlett O'Hara, who is the daughter of a wealthy Southern plantation owner as she goes through pre Civil War and the lovely extravagant parties during Civil War when her family loses everything and post-Civil War when she's trying to rebuild her life. We also follow her obsession with a man named Ashley. Um, throughout the entire movie, she is desperately in love with this man and she uses other men to try to get to him. One of the poor folks is a man named Rhett Butler who plays opposite Scarlett O'Hara. And this is that famous line that got them fined a few thousand dollars. The health plan on healthcare.gov. Sign up between November 1st and December 5th. Of course, that's after the ad. So that's the scene in which Rhett finally gives up on Scarlett O'Hara and leaves her to her own demise. And Scarlett is wondering what is she going to do now because she just lost her wealthy husband. Oh my gosh. And she finally realizes that she actually loved him the whole time. Um, but unfortunately, it was too late. And that word, damn, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, cost the studio $5,000. Uh, it was actually improved by the actor and the production code company asked for them to remove it several times, but the director of the film loved it so much that he just wanted it left in and he was willing to pay the fine. And now that's like the most famous line in the movie. So probably a good call on his part. Like I said, both of those guys competed for awards um, that same year, and it was actually Gone with the Wind that won. So won Best Picture that year. If you haven't seen it, you might want to check it out, but it is very long, so bring snacks, I guess. That takes us to the genre of film noir. I mentioned that that is a genre that was created by Hollywood in the 19, late 1930s, early 40s. Um, once again, at this point in history, we have obviously had color. Uh, but film noir is generally in black and white because it helps add to the dramatic effect of the uh, theme or genre of film noir. Film noir is usually based around a mystery. It's very dramatic. And the most famous film noir is probably The Maltese Falcon, which is about a Maltese Falcon that people thought was worth a bunch of money and then it was fake. And someone stole it and they tried to track it down. They couldn't. I guess I should probably share that screen. Listen, this won't do any good. A lot of film noirs, not all of them, also have a really odd, like, New Jersey accent, which we see. You'll never understand me, but I'll try once and then give it up. When a man's partner's killed, he's supposed to do something about it. It doesn't make any difference what you thought of him. He was your partner, and you're supposed to do something about it. And it happens we're in the detective business. I don't want one of your organizations gets killed. It's 
It's bad business to let the killer get away with it. Bad all around. Bad for every detective everywhere. Don't expect me to think of these things you're saying. Special reason for setting me to Wait till I'm through, then you can talk. I've no earthly reason to think I can trust you, and if I do this and get away with it, you have something on me that you can use whenever you want to. Since I've got something on you, I couldn't be sure that you wouldn't put a hole in me someday. All those are on one side. Maybe some of them are unimportant. I won't argue about that. But look at the number of them. What have we got on the other side? All we've got is that maybe you love me and maybe I love you. You know whether you love me or not. Maybe I do. I'll have some rotten nights after I've sent you over to battle pants. <laughs> All I've said doesn't mean anything to you, then forget it. We'll make it just this. I won't because all of me wants to, regardless of consequences. And because you counted on that with me, the same as you counted on that with all the others. Would you have done this to me if the book had been real? You got your money? Don't be too sure I'm as crooked as I'm supposed to be. That sort of reputation might be good business, bringing high-priced jobs and making it easier to deal with the enemy. So you can see it's a very dramatic, serious toned film uh, about a mystery, which is what film noir is. It's very serious and dramatic, and it is a crime mystery film. And that is what they are all like. And if you're into that, there's a whole bunch of them, and you can look them up. And that takes us to animated films. So, of course, like I mentioned earlier, the first animated film is Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I feel like probably everyone's seen that one, so I don't think we need to see a clip of it. Although the last time I taught this class, someone hadn't seen it before. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but another film produced by Walt Disney, well, after Walt Disney, um, was Fantasia. Fantasia is the first really super artistic film that Disney Studios ever made. It combined dance, orchestra, abstract artist. Um, pretty much every form of art was used in Fantasia, and they actually hired real artists to make them and consulted with them, such as Oscar Fischinger, who was an abstract artist that helped work on some of the scenes. Um, Fantasia was not a huge success for Disney. It's kind of like a cult classic now. Some people love it, some people don't. Um, it does have what a lot of people consider to be a little bit more mature tones as far as early Disney is concerned. It's not your G-rated film. I would still say it's like PG at least. I've seen worse films made from them today, but there's like a demon and devil in it, which wasn't appropriate for that period of time, at least as far as kid movies were concerned for them. Uh, and no, no, like, real dialogue happening between the characters. Uh, so it is more like a silent film would be. And kids are not too great <laughs> at sitting through silent films. Uh, especially when they're used to going to see a Disney film like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves that has a storyline and a plotline and dialogue. And Fantasia is more like a combination of short stories without any dialogue and just a soundtrack. So it wasn't super popular with children, but like I said, it does have a cult following today. And we will watch a very short clip of that you can see even the orchestra in the background there <laughs> this is the like really well-known scene
Mickey's going to take a nap. The broom's going to keep going. There's going to be way too much water in the room. Um, and it's just cute. I think it's a cute one. And Golly was doing what I always do and start tapping my feet. <laughs> um, so both Fantasia and the next film that we're going to be looking at are animated and they both take advantage of storyboards. Does anyone remember what a storyboard is? Yeah, yeah, they're drawing sketches of the different scenes and laying them out on a board and looking at them to make sure the plot works and the scenes work. Um, so Japan is currently leading the world in production of animation at the moment. Uh, for America, we've mostly gone to CGI, but a good chunk of Japan's animation is still hand-drawn, which is extremely impressive. They have chosen to stick with that. So there is kind of a little bit of nostalgia, like I have a soft place for it because I appreciate things that are handmade um, and hand drawn instead of computer generated. And we are going to look at Miyazaki's uh, film. He has created his own studio called Studio Ghibli or Ghibli, depending on which country you're producing it in. Um, in America, we say Ghibli. In Japan, it's Ghibli. Um, so it depends on where you're saying that word. But we're going to look at his most well-known film, Spirited Away. Is it my favorite one? No, but it's the one that won the most awards. So that's the one we're going to look at. And we're going to watch the trailer. And this is the part, well, it's one of the parts that always get cut out because it's copywritten. But it's important to keep in mind that this was all hand drawn. It does not look like it. Disney Studios presents a Studio Ghibli film. Honey, don't take a shortcut. You always get us lost. From master filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki. What is it? Come on, let's go in. I want to see what's on the other side. Where am I? Hey! This is a quick walk. Away. 
So yeah, all the details, texture, the lights, the darks, the shadows, that was all hand drawn by a team, although Miyazaki himself does hand draw most of them. Uh, and he likes to go back and critique everyone. So I don't know if I'd like to work under him because he's pretty OCD about things. Uh, that takes us to movies made strictly for art, and we're actually going to look at Cataratia. Today, a lot of artists do like to use films as their medium. They'll use it to light photography, spread social issues, uh, create fantasy realms, ideas like the Surrealists did. They will share dreams and thoughts, which is what Matthew Barney does, although this isn't really dreams, but it's kind of surrealist and um, just contemporary. Um, but we're going to look at Kater Atia. Kater Atia talks about change and um, economy in his short film, which is here. So with his film, Oil and Sugar, uh, he is making a commentary on how our economy has changed over time. And it's literally sugar cubes on a silver plate being melted by petroleum oil. So what do you guys think he's trying to make us realize about our economy? Yeah, so we are relying on oil now. Um, there's another statement, though, beyond that one, having to do with the sugar and the silver. Think back in olden days. What was the economy based, back, based on back in like the 1800s, 1700s? Spices, sugar cane, rum, silver. Today, almost the entire world's economy runs based on who owns what and oil. Uh, so our economy has shifted from goods that can be uh, produced to like what you said, non-renewable resources. So there's been a major shift in the world's economy and that's all there is to it. It's just gonna keep melting until there's nothing left, which I guess I can keep showing you. I mean, it's not gonna hurt. <laughs> I'll just mute it so that you can hear me. So today, artistic filmmakers do short films like this for um, museums, galleries. Uh, some of them do longer films like the clock film that we didn't really watch, but it just showed a 24 hour time lapse of a clock. Just time passing. Um, so there are long film, short films, the Matthew Barney films that I didn't have time to talk about, the Chromaster series, that's a series of five about an hour and a half long videos they're an hour and a half each uh, they were made out of order um, very artistic interpretations on the reproductive cycle and um, how people sexually mature so different artists go after their passions and they figure out how to use film to illustrate those passions today Tomorrow, there is no class. Just a reminder, it is Friday. Yay. Um, you guys do need to finish up that discussion post. It is due tomorrow, and you need to keep working on your censorship projects. And I will see you all on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. What is I going to Told you this one was gonna be long. <laughs> yeah, we do have to clean the dust, guys. Corey, hang on.
Thanks, Anna. Have a good weekend. Hey, Jaden. Hey, Addison.